Hello ladies and gentlemen, Big Daddy Top Hat here. Not too long ago on here we began looking at various wrestling games, including the Final Fight spin-offs known as the Slam Master series, along with many of the WWF's fantastic arcade games, such as the games produced by Technos Japan, and the Mortal Kombat-like Acclaim games. With so many wrestling games in existence, it has been a tough job deciding which game to cover next. But ultimately, I have opted for what I consider the greatest wrestling game ever made. WWF No Mercy, now released 20 years ago, is still considered by many to be the absolute benchmark in the wrestling genre. The game managed to deliver heaps of fun, providing one of the most entertaining sports entertainment simulators that has ever been published. In fact, when it comes to this game, I would not only agree that it could be the best ever wrestling game experience, but these days it could even be the greatest Nintendo 64 exclusive that is still worth going back and playing. This game is that damn good. Today we are going to be looking at the history of this game, what makes it so special, and even the controversies and frustrations that came with this title on its journey too. Despite the game's high quality, this ladies and gentlemen is the mad story of WWF No Mercy, the Nintendo 64's great one. Dig diggity dog. Yeah. Thus far in this tantalising sub-series of videos, we have solely focused on the realm of 2D wrestling games. With the newest game we have looked at so far being WWF In Your House, which was first released in November of 1996. WWF games were yet to make the jump to the world of 3D polygon gaming, but despite this, another promotion had beaten them to the punch. Popular Japanese promotion NJPW would have its own video game that featured polygon graphics released an entire 14 months before In Your House, all the way back in September of 1995, the same year WrestleMania the arcade game saw release. The game known as Tukon Retsuden provided an interesting glimpse into what the future held for the genre. Due to the promotion's limited popularity outside of Japan, this game developed by Yuke's would see significant changes when published by Activision in the West. To save on licensing costs, the game's name would be changed to Power Pro Wrestling and the NJPW roster would be swapped out for characters created for the game, however they would still retain NJPW movesets. The game with its impressive for its time graphics would receive fairly strong reviews in the West, however all review sources complained that the game lacked a level of appeal for not including any of the journalists favourite American wrestlers. As we moved into the latter portion of the 90s, the WWF grew and grew in popularity, becoming the most mainstream the product had ever been. So a demand for a polygonal WWF game grew and grew too. Sadly for WWF fans, the company were a bit behind in the world of gaming, as it would take the company three years longer than NJPW to get their first game featuring this graphical style. The first WWF game of this style was known as WWF Warzone, which was developed by Iguana West and published by Acclaim in 1998. The game had its fair share of flaws, but due to the WWF being ridiculously popular and the game depicting everyone's favourite WWF wrestlers in 3D for the first time, the game was a smash hit. But little did wrestling fans know that this was only the beginning. Soon the concept would be expanded upon in every area with the release of WWF Attitude, a game that features more moves, better graphics but most impressively this time around, a huge roster as opposed to a limited selection. Despite these game successes, WWF were not the only American promotion around who were having wrestling games being published featuring their license. WCW were having titles released across multiple platforms that were often finding more success than their WWF counterparts. This would cause the WWF to drop a claim in favour of THQ, the very company who were publishing the popular WCW games. Some of the most memorable of these titles were WCW vs NWO World Tour and WCW NWO Revenge. Both of these games were developed in Japan by a company known as the Aki Corporation. These games were created using the same engines and mechanics featured in the Japan only virtual wrestling series. Amazing games featuring the greatest wrestling gameplay that has ever been conceived. 
the very first of these games would be localised as WCW vs The World in 1997 for the PlayStation and featured various modes including a League Challenge, Best of Seven, Exhibition, Elimination, Tournament, League and Double Title. Such modes are predominantly characteristic of Japanese pro wrestling as opposed to American customs. Interestingly, on top of the 13 WCW wrestlers the game featured, an incredible 51 more were included consisting of wrestlers who were highly popular in Japan. Sadly, their names were all changed in this game and referred to as fictional wrestlers, but it's easy enough to see who each of them originally represented. The Aki wrestling games would go from strength to strength with the first WWF incarnation arriving in the form of WWF WrestleMania 2000. Amusingly seeing release in 1999, a year before a wrestling pay-per-view of the same name hit screens. The game shares its engine with Virtual Pro Wrestling 2 Odo Kisho, but the two titles differ considerably and feature completely different rosters. The game featured a number of improvements over the WCW games that came before it, including adding cage matches and a first blood mode. Reversals and counter moves were also made much more commonplace. Past this point, it finally brings us to the year 2000 and the release of WWF No Mercy itself, the most refined game using the Aki formula of play yet. When it comes to this game's development, its existence was first announced early in the year 2000 and a playable demo became available to experience that year at the E3 event, showing off various playable wrestlers and the arena for the WWF Smackdown show. Interestingly as well, that year aside from the Nintendo 64 version of the game being announced, a Game Boy Color version of the title was also stated to be in development. Both versions of the game were set to be able to connect using the Nintendo 64's Game Boy Track transfer pack. The primary purpose of this would have been to input points earned in the portable game to spend on rewards in the Nintendo 64's version, in the game Smackdown Mall, which we shall talk a lot more about later. Sadly, despite this concept being interesting, the Game Boy Color version of the game was scrapped, but at least we still got the amazing home version. No Mercy would deliver a virtual pro wrestling experience that built on what could be found in WrestleMania 2000. This meant a game that featured graphical improvements and an all new championship mode that allowed this game's fresh roster to participate in various new storylines. Further to this, the game's character creation mode was made more in depth and more refined, a feature that was pretty much a staple of the wrestling game genre by this point. In terms of its gameplay, No Mercy features many of the same mechanics as the previous Aki games, including core elements in its matches such as players being able to grapple with their opponents and perform various moves via combining button presses with directional taps on the Nintendo 64 analog stick. You compare this game's grappling with the titled Momentum System, which has also been retained from previous games. What I mean by this is that as a wrestler lands attacks or even manages to perform poses, their attitude meter begins to fill up and their opponents decrease. This swing in momentum is key in winning matches, as when the attitude meter is full, when in the right position, players can execute their powerful finishers or signature moves. If I can recall correctly, many of these moves are executable by successfully managing to perform a strong grapple, then following it up by performing clockwise circular motions on the analog stick. Executing these big moves and lowering your opponent's attitude meters make gaining a pinfall or submission more likely. The game also allows the player the freedom to do most things in the ring you see on TV, including reversing your opponent's grapples and moves, running the ropes, running opponents against ropes, smashing opponents into the turnbuckles or ascending to the top rope to perform high-risk aerial maneuvers. In fact, you can brawl around the outside of the ring too and smash your opponent through the announcer's table, or even pull weapons from the crowd to brutalise enemies further with. If none of this is enough, you can even force your opponents backstage, so that you can fight in car parks, changing rooms and other areas. The game gives you all sorts of freedom in your fighting. Now, with regards to further changes from WrestleMania 2000, to give an extra layer of playability to the game, additional characters, arenas, special moves and extra costumes can all be unlocked in the game's new Smackdown Mall, which we touched on slightly earlier. Unlike modern crap, these unlockables can be gathered via collecting in-game currency, rather than having to turn over any hard-earned real-life extra cash. So there is many more regions to go back to this one than the likes of Fortnite, where players all pay to win matches. 
Collecting the in-game currency can be achieved in various modes, such as playing the game's championship mode, which allows players to choose which WWF championship belt that they would like to compete for. Within this mode, there are seven separate championships to go for, with each scenario resulting in its own preset storyline. To give this mode even more depth, each of these seven submodes feature branching paths that result in the stories changing whether players win or lose certain matches. So pairing the Smackdown Mall with these very branching experiences instantly gives this game a crazy amount of playability, and we are only just scratching the surface. If you do not fancy gathering currency this way, the game also features a truly awesome survival mode. Basically an awesome Royal Rumble mode where the player must attempt to defeat 100 straight opponents. While the various match types are all present in the game's championship mode, they can also be individually selected in the game's exhibition mode. There is a variety of match types synonymous with pro wrestling that were present in previous virtual pro wrestling games from Aki. You know, all the classics including tag team matches players, or the ability to go one on one with The Undertaker. But in addition to all of this, this was the first Aki game to include ladder matches, a stipulation which was highly popular in the WWF at the time, ever since the rise of the Hardy Boys. This game, like its predecessor, WrestleMania 2000, took advantage of the fact that the Nintendo 64 offered four controller ports. This means that the game can be enjoyed up to four players, whether it be a four-way match, a tag team match, a rumble, or whatever else happened to take your fancy. As mentioned earlier, the game built on everything else seen too, such as new arenas and the inclusion of backstage areas to brawl in, for the first time in a game developed by the company. The game in total features over 60 different playable characters made up of famous members from WWF television, thus meaning you can replicate most of the matches you saw on the television show in your bedroom on the Nintendo 64. In addition to the giant roster, the game offers a further 18 slots for players to be able to save their own creative wrestlers to the cartridge. No Mercy's extensive character creation options allow players to choose wrestlers' moves, customise their body attributes, their clothing, entrances, competitive features and even choose their character's sex. The game provides a range of possibilities for those feeling creative. Considering all the greatness I've just laid out, you would expect that the Christmas morning I received this game would have been a fantastic gaming day. However, something very strange would happen. Myself and my brother were having a lot of fun with this game, spending the hard-earned cash we had made in Smackdown Mall, unlocking the game's many features, only to keep noticing that all of our progress was being continually lost. When we got back to school after the Christmas holiday break, we would soon learn that our school friends had been suffering from the same issue too. It turns out that the game contained glitches that would delete the game's save data. So THQ would soon issue a statement that players should reset their cartridges to factory defaults to fix the issue. This sadly did not fix the problem and the No Mercy customer base would end up angry enough for the game to be highlighted on the UK show known as Watchdog. Watchdog was a BBC TV show that featured investigative journalists who would hold big companies accountable when they did their customers wrong. So the game appearing on this show certainly was not a good look for the game's PR department. Eventually THQ would cave and the company eventually instituted a recall program where those affected by the glitch would be able to exchange their copy of the game for a fixed one. So thankfully I could just take my game down to GameStation and they exchanged it for a fresh working copy for me. One thing that was not acknowledged that day though is that these new PAL copies for some reason removed all blood from the game, which was a tad grating but at least the game worked as it should now. Despite the glitch issue with the game, that did not stop me playing the hell out of it, prior to my original cartridge being recalled. The game was so addictive that every time the game glitched out, I would just continuously start the game from scratch, trying to purchase everything from Smackdown Mall over and over again. I could not get enough of No Mercy. Thankfully though, with my glitch free copy of the game, I finally had the opportunity to unlock everything this game had to offer, including the characters that take longer to unlock in the title too, such as the legendary late great Andre the Giant and even the Ho. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, in a hilarious move, the most expensive procurement in Smackdown Mall is a high-end escort, because I guess that was the amusing world we used to live in back in the Attitude Era. If you wanted to buy one of the Godfather's high-end ladies from Smackdown Mall, then you would have to pay for it. 
In fact, I almost based this entire video around this elusive unlockable, but I was a bit concerned YouTube might steal my advertising money, so I changed the video structure. What makes this unlockable most funny is that with it being the hardest to achieve in the game, an argument could be made that the actual end goal of this title is to spend all of your money on a prostitute, which to be fair I guess means that the hoe in this game is the personification of the Attitude Era itself. So I retrospectively love this silly inclusion more than I did back in the year 2000. Amazing stuff. Wrestling has never been more popular than it was around the time this game was released. And as a result, linked with the addictive gameplay, everyone I knew loved this game. But what did the critics think back then? Let's find out. GameSpot would praise No Mercy for its wide variety of moves, including each character's finishing moves, as well as the ease with which the manoeuvres could be executed. GamePro would comment that learning the controls is as simple as a rake to the eyes, and IGN called the controls easy to use. Many would also comment on the game's step up from WrestleMania 2000 with Game Revolution calling No Mercy a revamp and upgrade over its predecessor. Sources across the board would also love the replayability the creator wrestler mode and Smackdown Mall would bring. Electronic Gaming Monthly also praised the game's improvements, commenting that while WrestleMania 2000 was not much of an improvement over WCW NWO Revenge before it, No Mercy looks and plays like a proper follow-up. The game's championship mode was hailed as an improvement over the previous game. Writing for IGN, Blake Norton praised the branching paths of the championship mode, writing that it would have players coming back for weeks and weeks to try each belt, try each twist, try each new plot development, then do it again with different wrestlers. Whilst it was very clear back in the day why this was considered such a good game, what was it exactly about it though that results in people still acknowledging its quality over so many other wrestling games now? I guess we should explore this side of things a little more. How has this game in many people's minds stood the test of time? and on the bloody Nintendo 64 of all systems. I guess firstly the game feels like, well, a game. It's actually fun. It feels like with these Aki games, thought was put into making these titles as fun as possible, rather than necessarily trying to make them the most realistic to the television show. The fighting mechanics and game's grappling and counter system is simple enough for newcomers to quickly grasp, yet complex enough to keep us coming back for more. It is this pick up and play ability combined with the outrageous amount of play modes and unlockables that make this game simply irresistible and one of the most satisfying games to play of all time. Many people argue today that 20 years later wrestling games are struggling to capture the fun found in this one, which is partially down to the constant prioritisation and demand for realism. This in turn means that most new games lose the foundation of what makes wrestling games so good in the first place. Graphics alone do not make a great game, and they never will, and fans ongoing appreciation for No Mercy, over most of which that has come after it, is surviving proof of this. The game's legacy is often addressed and reflected on, interestingly even by THQ themselves at points. We nearly got a sequel on the Nintendo 64 known as WWF Backlash, which was sadly cancelled. However, after Aki worked on the WWF games, they would then go on to work on games published by EA, the Def Jam Vendetta titles, which many consider the spiritual successors to No Mercy, so let me know if you want me to look at those. In 2020, No Mercy is still constantly cited as the best wrestling game that was ever made, and a benchmark for quality. In fact, new American wrestling promotion AEW officially recently announced their first ever video game, with No Mercy's director Hideo Yuki Iwashita at the helm, dreaming of replicating that game's success. Personally, I think it is perhaps one of the greatest, if not the best game to go back and visit on the Nintendo 64 platform, because most of the best games in the system's library have been by now either ported to superior hardware or been topped in their respective genres. No Mercy is still a Nintendo 64 exclusive, and considering it is still the king of the wrestling game mountain, it is worth powering up the 64 just to play it with friends. The game is that bloody brilliant. WWF No Mercy is a game I feel will never stop being talked about, and rightly so, considering it is the apex of its genre. 
So, ladies and gentlemen, that was the mad story of WWF No Mercy. If you enjoyed today's content, why not check out my wrestling game playlist that precedes this video. And if you want even more Top Hat Gaming Man in your life, then consider backing the channel for $5 a month on Patreon. I upload an exclusive video over there every single week. This week we look at the top 10 JRPGs you need to play before you die. Yeah! Speaking of patrons who make my job possible, shout outs go out to Sebastian Venice, Carl Johnson, A Murder of Crows, Heo Paulo Lopez, Joseph Rasmick, Corey Imar Sr., Capcom vs SNK, BXL Gotham, Rowan Dinch to Evan Boulder, Philip Manth, Camber Rambo82, Azra Rarakai, Keith Ferguson, Jockin Morella, Prince Knight, Michael Cullix, Ago, Jordan Durant, Adriel Light85, Alethia Swanson, Timothy W. Haskins II, Nick Daniels, Princess Zana, Glennie Glenn, Daniel Daly, Computer Man, House of the Ted, Gary Pinkett, EC Professor, Kid Anime, Justin Wang, Aaron McNamara, Hermes Gonzalez, Instant Gratification Monkey, Man Shovel, James Bishop, JB, Posty XL, Michael Hall, Wesley Sanghee, Ben Dover, Langston Miller, New, Brian Barry, Stephen Lewis, Sarah Powell, Vlamink Renee, Marino Oliga, Chris Cool, TOG Driver, Adrian Hannington, Bernard NG, Richard Stu Stewart, James McDonald, Crazy Yarl, Dan Van Dammit, Adam Castin, Louis Viant, John Bates, David Bauer, Chris Fisk, Paul Elliott, Me Machine Dean, Mike Bruno, Rick67, Antonio Rodriguez, Harms Christian, Craig Jenkins, Tom Elliott, Retroverse.com, Casey Wright, Synth Spaces, Zai. And a thank you to Gunther Hendricks who joined the shout out tier by becoming a member by alternatively hitting the join button. So I would like to thank everyone for supporting me in all the many ways that you do. I love you all very much. Yeah, cheerio.